eyebrows and your foreheads today, uh, and it's better than, than uh, not seeing you at all, so I'm so glad you're here. I've been trying to get used to that. I'm a professor, many of you know, at Cedarville University, and uh, it's not been a difficulty having students with masks for the ones that I already know, but for the ones I'm trying to get to know, it's very hard uh, to uh, get to know them when I don't get to see their faces, so I've I threatened my one class, I said, you're going to have to wear the same outfit every day for two weeks, and your hair's not going to change, uh, and so forth and so on, so I can recognize you when you come in. So I'm trying to figure that out. But uh, nonetheless, we have a glorious day today. I mean, this is the best of what you could have in Ohio in August, right? Uh, to walk out today and have a beautiful, cool day today, and to enjoy that. Now today, you'll find in your bulletins uh, some notes. And you'll see that there's uh, kind of full notes, and nobody's surprised if you've been around the manual for a while. Uh, I'm not used to giving scanty notes. There's kind of full ones there. Uh, but I want you to see that, and you'll notice there's going to be some blanks that I hope you'll fill out as we go along. And this one is, to a certain extent, a topical sermon, something that we often don't do. We usually have just a set passage, and we kind of work through it. But today, I'm going to work through a number of passages because I want to try to talk to you about the whole idea of church membership Uh, And that doesn't come from any one passage, but it comes from a ton of them. And a little bit of the method in my madness is trying to convince you, uh, number one, that what we're trying to do here at Emmanuel, we think, has strong biblical warrant for it, uh, and that the process is shaped around that, even though we fully recognize, as with all church processes, to a certain degree, there's a matter of prudence and wisdom that guides those processes. That isn't a thus saith the Lord issue. Uh, but it's the church trying to take what the scriptures teach about who we are, about how we should organize ourselves and be the people of God, and try to put those into processes that facilitate that. So I want to talk to you about being a member. And I want to preface this that if you're here and you're visiting and you're considering membership, uh, here's a twofer for you uh, right here. Uh, this is actually the first session of what I would do in the membership class. So if you're listening here and you're moving toward membership, right, you get a coupon for one session off right, today. So in terms of that, so you can think about yourself as already on the start, because this is the kind of thing that if I'd sit down with people who are starting membership, and I think we have like five or six people right now who are coming, uh, and I also want to say that you're going to be hearing from me. I'm going to announce uh, the next membership class getting up and running. It'll probably be, unless the responses from people come back really negative, it'll probably be on Wednesday nights, uh, overlapping the time that we have blast. Uh, And so we'll have it in the evenings. We have three sessions that we'll have for that uh, as we think about coming into membership here. Now, we've been talking about the doctrine of ecclesiology, uh, and I want to use these terms uh, so that you understand them, so it's not just kind of in-house speak, right? Ecclesiology is the church's uh, term that they have coined over the years to speak about how do we understand this thing called the church. And it comes from the Greek word for church or assembly, really the the term in Greek just means an assembly of people. It's called ekklesia, that's where you get ecclesiology from. And then a word at the end, lagos, which means a discourse or an account of the church. So we've been talking about the key doctrines that shape our life as the people of God, that tell us who God is, tell us who we are, tell us how we relate to him, and tell us how we should be in the world, both for each other and for the world outside of Christ. So we've been talking about that all the way through. We're in ecclesiology right now, the doctrine of the church. Our last one that we'll go to here uh, coming up at the, in, uh, uh, I believe we'll start in uh, October, is we'll start talking about eschatology. And that one is eschatos is the Greek word for end or goal. And so eschatology is talking about the end or goal of God's whole program. So we're going to talk about that as we come to the end. All right, now here's a a bit of a review, right? My teacher side of me says that some of you need a review, so I want to give you a little bit of a review here of what we've talked about, about what is the church is a fundamental question before we start talking about how a church should operate. Say, there's two senses in which the church is used, and sometimes it gets confusing. So there's the church, and then there's a church, okay? So the church, universal, is all those everywhere, Steve was referring to people who belong to Jesus who are worshiping all around the globe this morning in very different conditions, different languages, right, different settings. But all those everywhere from the time of Christ's ascension to the finish of his work and his ascension into heaven until he returns, the time of period in which we live right now. 
who have repented of their sins, trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. Okay? So they're trusting in him alone based on what he did. So Christ came, and he came into a story that had already gotten started where creation had rebelled against its creator. And we had set ourselves off from him and distanced from the creator that we were made for and also lost the life we were created to enjoy. So Christ pursued us. He came, took on human form, lived a sinless life, went up to a cross. He went up on his own. He wasn't taken to a cross. He went up to die on our behalf, to take what was rightfully ours, the punishment for our sin, and to give to us what he had earned. And so when we put our faith in him, we get to participate in the benefits of his death, where he satisfied God's just requirement of, of, for the judgment on our sin, and also we get to participate in the benefits of his resurrection. We get to come to life. So as we believe on him, that's the only way to come into a right relationship with God. So everyone, whether they're in Nigeria today, or they're in France, or they're in Russia, or in here in Xenia, Ohio, the most exotic of all those places, right? Uh, they're followers of Jesus by believing in him, and we're united in Christ in that one. The second sense, though, is the church local that talks about Emmanuel Baptist Church, right? A group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ. Okay, now we'll to pause here for a moment. Is that that's a kind of a startling statement because in America we don't think of the church that way often. We think, no, this is a group of people that I like some things that they do, and so I attend here as a consumer. And then I watch over what they do, and as soon as the product they have is not what I want, then I shop at another religious provider. Okay, this is, oh, I'm walking in, and when I walk into a manual, I'm walking into a group of people that I have a definite responsibility for. And I'm accountable too. That's a whole different kind of environment when you think about that. So to officially affirm, meaning when people come here and walk into the building and they become a member, I want to ask them if they say, well, I'm a religious person. I say, well, great. I'm glad you're a religious person. I'm a person of faith. Great. I'm glad you're a person of faith. I don't want you to be an unbelieving person. But I want to ask them, well, what are you putting your faith in? All the religious activity that you have, what is it centered on? And in particular, I want to say, what are you looking to to save you from the darkness in your own soul? Who's going to help you with the guilt that you have? Who's going to deal with the brokenness that you feel? Who's going to deal with the regret that you have over the life that you have? Who's going to give you purpose and meaning and direction? Because I want to point them to Jesus. Right? So I want to do that in terms of that. So affirm that membership in Jesus Christ united with him and his kingdom. And that gets at the idea that when we come to follow Jesus, one of the biblical images is we come under Jesus as our king. So he's the ruler and what we did in, in the history of humanity is we rebelled against the ruler and we thought we could set up our own kingdom and our own kingdom can't get for us what we truly desire, it just brings wreck and carnage into our life. And now when we're rebels and we recognize we are rebels, we put down our arms, we confess that we are rebels and we say, Jesus, save us, we get brought back underneath his benevolent rule. And so it reminds us that we're called not just to be people, right, if, you, if you've been around church for a while, God says that if you reject Jesus Christ and you turn your back on him, there will be ultimate eternal punishment. Some people think of salvation as, or the relationship with Jesus, well then, now I've got fire insurance. Yes, I don't have to worry about that, right? And then that's all it is, and then I go about living my life. Well, if you understand what it means to be related to Christ, no, now you've been brought back into a right relationship with God, and now you can truly live if you submit to him. So we're trying to encourage one another to follow Jesus and we're doing that under qualified leaders through gospel preaching, the good news about God in Christ, and gospel ordinances, communion and baptism, right? So we've talked about what a church is. Then the purpose of the church, the last two Sundays, I'm trying to synthesize what I was preaching about and Pastor Steve here. We find out that God's purpose for the church is to draw all types of people into a growing relationship with Christ by the work of the Spirit. That should be our priority. And so when you walk in here, the goal of every person who's following Jesus is I'm praying for this morning. Uh, before we, we're back in the, the green room here. If you've ever seen it here, we're gathering together to be, be prepared to come out and lead the service today. And as we were out there, we were praying today that we would be God's vehicles to point people to Jesus today. 
We wanted people to worship him, to look to him, to follow him. And to the degree that we've done that, we've served you well, we've loved you well. Because for a believer, to love another person is to love them toward Jesus. To make Jesus as great as he really is, to commend him by my life and my word, that's my mission. Right? It's my mission for my brothers and sisters to grow them cro- closer to Christ by my life and for people who don't know Jesus to introduce them and commend Jesus to them. Right? So the first one. And then to be in the gr- this growing relationship means that we're individually growing in our love for Christ as well as loving each other toward Christ. Right? It's not a static place. It's not something that once you get on the roll, you're in a static place and now you have a place of privilege. No, you're in a place, it's a dynamic place where now I am following Christ on my own because I want to be the, 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 the agent that God wants me to be when I meet the Robins when they come. And the Robins want to be that agent when they meet me. Or when the Gilhoods come in and I meet the Gilhoods, right? Or the Tucks and they meet me, right? We're there for each other to bless each other. I'm not just sitting there just to see what they can offer me. I'm there to invest in them and they in me. And then this allows us to enjoy and express the reality of Christ in our common life and declare the reality of Christ to the world. Okay, so a purpose. And now, let's move on a little bit. Now, we want to talk about our subject this morning, how the church is structured. And I'm going to introduce you a term that comes up in the discussion of the structure of the church, and it's called church polity, right? Very exciting stuff, right, just to think about polity. And the good thing about this, this is not about politics, so we can put that aside. Uh, we don't want to introduce that here. But this is the idea of the description of what the Bible teaches about how a church should organize itself and govern its affairs. So when you come into here, why does the church organize itself? Why am I up here as a pastor? What qualifies me to be here? Why am I in this position? What is a person who is a member supposed to do and to be? And how do we organize ourselves? How do we deal with uh, spending the money that comes in through that offering plate? And online, how do we organize ourselves to do our mission? Right. So this includes the nature and the roles of the members and the leaders, as well as the relationship of this church to every other church, okay? Now, we're going to talk about all three of those. So over the next three Sundays, we're going to talk about members, then we're going to talk about leaders, and then we're going to talk about what the church practices and talk about its relationship to other churches. And we're going to conclude at the end of this series with the idea of, well, why do we find ourselves in the branch of the church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, Why do we find ourselves where we are? And is that important? Is that significant? And so forth and so on. Okay, let's move on. Now, who makes up a local church? And this is a contentious issue here. We say in our documents, members. But what is a member? Okay. How do you become a member? Is membership really biblical in terms of that? So that's the issue that we want to talk about, all those different things. Okay, now... Here is what it means to be a member of Emmanuel. So if you're, if you're thinking about membership, you're starting on your membership class right now uh, in terms of that, okay? So here is how we define it at Emmanuel. It's not our own definition. This is uh, probably cobbled together from a lot of people's uh, different conversations about this in Scripture itself. But to be a member means that a public formal agreement, it's called a covenant, A public formal agreement has been made between the church and an individual Christian. A public formal. There's a process that we have, and many of you have been around. If a person comes to Christ and they become a member of Emmanuel, one thing that they will do is they will give their testimony. They will tell how they came into a relationship with Jesus Christ so that the body can hear their testimony and affirm that they're a follower of Jesus. Sometimes that's done in person, Right, of people who aren't too fearful. Sometimes if you're not a public speaker, it's done via video. Sometimes it's done via the pastor reading your testimony for you. Right? Not everybody's an upfront person, but it's a public declaration so that everybody knows your identity and then you're entering into an agreement between the church and that individual Christian. So this formal agreement they enter into sets out the responsibilities of each party. The church agrees, one, to affirm the Christian's relationship with God through Christ by the work of the Spirit. That is, if you come to meet with any of the pastors, and when you ultimately stand before the congregation, my primary responsibility is to say, do you know Jesus Christ? Now, ultimately, I can't look into your heart. 
All I can understand is what you say and how you live. But I'm going to ask you those kinds of questions when you come in. We have had people at Emmanuel Baptist Church who, is, who have come to be members. Uh, one stands out, I know I've mentioned to you before, I remember having a lady come to us and she started to enjoy being at, at Emmanuel Baptist Church and she said, I just want to become a member of here. And I said, why? She said, because I just really like the people here and I enjoy being here. And I said, well, great. I'm glad that that's the case. And then we sat down and I said, well, tell me about your spiritual journey. How, tell me how you came to know Christ. And she just looked at me like a deer in the headlights and said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I said, okay, well, let me tell you about the story about what happened, who you are, about what Jesus did. And we did that. And as we're sitting there in the office, she said, well, I've never done that before. Can I do that today? And I said, well, sure you can. Sure you can do that today, right? So that's a responsibility because I have a responsibility before God to love you enough to help you understand where you stand with respect to God. That's the most loving thing I can do for you is to help you get right with him, right? And then the second thing, to oversee the Christian's discipleship. Well, this makes it real, you know, you're, you're signing up for an issue where I'm open to this body because they have a responsibility to help me grow. That means I'm open to their encouragement, to sometimes their criticism because they're committed to my growth and so I'm not just here to just exist but people are coming toward me for my benefit and vice versa, right? So church isn't a place where you should be left alone. Church isn't a place where you should be able to come and hide. Church isn't a place where you get to hang out on the fringes. Now, if you're here today and you're hanging on the fringes because that's as close as you can get, we're so glad you're here. But I want to tell you that Christ wants to love you into the center. He wants to love you into the center and that to hang out there, you're missing out on the richness of what he wants to do in your life. Right? Now, I know the culture tells us, and sometimes our fears tell us, but what if I let people in? What if I let people in? Well, the only way you're going to be loved closer to Christ is to let people in. Okay? So, talk about that. So, the Christian promises to invest in and submit to the church. But is this whole thing, is this really biblical? All right? Let's read a couple things here. And I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 5. Okay? We've seen this passage before. Uh, and I want to warn you right here, the forefront of the passage, the problem that Paul is dealing with is going to make us hard to hear the background. So when I'm talking about a peek behind the curtain, really what I want to look at in 1 Corinthians 5 is how the church was supposed to operate that tells us a whole lot about how Paul, the Apostle Paul, understood the church and what kind of place it was and what the members were supposed to be able to do. All right, so let's read this. They're dealing with a very dark situation they're dealing with a church that has lost its mind in terms of sexual issues. And right now they have an a individual who's involved in a kind of relationship with his stepmother that is just, uh, in this context, too dark to talk about. And so what's happening here is Paul is appalled. Paul is appalled. How's it go? Paul is appalled, right, at what is going on. And he is beside himself. He's already very clear about what should happen He's, he's just out of his mind that the church hasn't acted to do what they should have done. So here's what he says. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? Now what I want you to notice here is Paul is speaking to the church collectively. He's not speaking to the pastors or to the deacons. He's speaking to the whole church. He's asking, you guys should have come together and done something about this. Okay. For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit as one who is present with you in the way. I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, right? This is one of the powerful, there's a uniqueness in the side here there's a uniqueness here. When the people of God are gathered corporately, there's a, a uniqueness in the sense of the way Jesus is present and active than, than is different from when you're individually in your prayer closet. That's why there's no such thing as we read through the New Testament as a Christian who's a faithful follower of Jesus who's a lone ranger for Jesus. No such thing. So Paul assumes this here. When you come together in the power of our Lord Jesus is present, Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And what Paul means here is because this person is living in open, unrepentant sin, 
you turn to him as the body of Christ and he refuses to return, repent of it, you turn to say, you don't have the marks of a follower of Jesus and we are warning you that this does not look like what would be happening in a person's life who knows Christ. And so we're going to treat you as if you're an unbeliever. So that the spirit may be saved, the goal of this action is not to get rid of the person, but to redeem the person, to draw them back to Christ. So your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? So he uses the illustration of dough as the body of Christ, yeast as tolerating open, unrepentant sin. That's going to affect everybody. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new in unleavened batch as you really are for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed therefore let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth verse 9 I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people now notice this very carefully not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and the swindlers or adulterers in this case you would have to leave this world Right? The mission of the church is to go after all of the idolaters and, and uh, fornicators and sinners that all of us were and by God's grace have been delivered from that. That's our mission. To go after people who are caught up in sin just like us with an empathy for what it be, means to be in that. That's our mission. Paul says, I'm not calling you out of the world. Notice what he's saying here. For Christ, our, uh, uh, sorry, um, in, in middle in verse uh, 10. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an adulterer or a slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Now here, without going after all the details of that, let me draw some points here that you need to see. Okay, Two things out of 1 Corinthians 5. Churches have an inside and an outside. Paul is writing to people and he assumes that they know who their fellow believers are. And he also knows that they have a different responsibility toward their fellow believers than they have towards somebody who doesn't profess Christ. So we don't expect as the followers of Christ, who by the grace of God have been changed in terms of our direction of life and our attitudes and aptitudes and, and, and goals by his grace, we don't expect people who don't know Jesus to behave as we should. We don't expect that. But when it comes to fellow believers of Christ, when I look at Jared as my brother in Christ, I have expectations for him that are rooted in what God wants him to be for his blessing, and I'm trying to hold him to that in a loving, gracious way and encourage him in that path because he has the ability and the responsibility. But I have to know that he's a brother. And so this assumes that the church knows who its members are and that there's some sort of public happening so that they know that that person has believed in Christ. So I know Stephen Gaines, and I know he has believed in Christ because he's given a public testimony, and that's why I'm called to be accountable for him as a follower of Jesus. Second thing, Christians are under the authority of the church and are to be excluded if they persist in living in open, unrepentant sin. Well, here is the idea is that if Barry, which would not happen, so Barry Skelly comes up to me someday, and he says, you know, I hate my wife, and uh, I'm just going to go have an affair with somebody here down the street, Right? Well, Barry is a professed believer of Christ. And if I went after Barry and I said, Barry, I love you. You're my brother. And I'd talk with him over and over again. And I would appeal to him, Barry, you need to return to Christ. You need to repent of this. You need to be as Christ toward your wife. I don't care what she's done. I don't care what she's done. You need to move back toward Jesus. And if Barry just gives me the, 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 the hand to the face, says, forget it, Greg. And then I go grab Chris Smith because Chris knows Barry. I go grab Galen Smith and I grab them and say, brothers, come with me. Listen to me. I want to talk to Barry. Listen to our conversation. Maybe I'm mistaken in my judgment, but come with me. And if they agree with me that Barry's living in open arms, we're begging him, Barry, please, for your sake, for your family's sake, please come back, please. This may go over a period of time, but if Barry continues to do that as a follower of Christ, we as a church have to do something. If it was stealing, if it was anger, if it was whatever, right? Now, that's the extreme, but it assumes that Barry is accountable to us and we're accountable for him. So I can't be in the church, right? The church often fails in two ways. One, things are happening among us that are dark, and we just put the blinders on. I hear no evil, see no evil, right? 
kind of thing like that. I just don't want to mess. It's, uh, it's ugly. I don't want to step into somebody's life like that. That's ugly, right? Don't ask me. That's too awkward. On the other hand, we err on the side of not lovingly coming after someone, and we just give them the right foot of fellowship out the door, right? Those two extremes are not the heart of Jesus. Right here in the middle is where you're digging in, and everybody who's a parent in here, you know that. You know what it's like to, to dig in and advocate for the heart of your child, to hang in there. Sometimes they're saying, you hate me. You're ruining my life. And you say, no, I love you, and I'm hanging in here, and I say no. Right? See some chuckling parents out here. Right? So those are the kinds of things that the church in 1 Corinthians 5. Then Hebrews 13, 17. Right? Lest you think I'm picking on people, let's get one that be beats up on me. Right? 13, 17. And uh, Pastor Van will tell you this, Pastor Steve, Will, all these different ones. This is a verse that honestly at times when I think about it, I just wonder whether I should be doing what I'm doing. It's a heavy verse. Right? So here it is in verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they watch over you as those who must give an account to do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Right? So two things here I want to say. Christians give up their independence to submit to their church leaders insofar as those leaders faithfully represent Christ insofar as they faithfully represent Christ. Because what we're going to see about the church is that if I deviate from the truth, if Steve deviates from the truth, if Van deviates from the truth, this church should stand up and say, you don't deserve that office anymore. Step down. If I deviate from the truth in terms of my personal habits and disciplines, if I treat my wife and my children in ways that are dishonoring to the cause of Christ, somebody needs to come up to me and say, Greg, you need to step back. But the idea here, church leaders know who they're spiritually responsible for, right? And I know I've said this to you before. I'm not responsible for the Christians at Naz. I'm not responsible for those out at Grace. I'm not responsible for Calvary or Grace out in Cedarville. That's not the people I'm responsible for. But for every person who has committed themselves to this church, I'm responsible for you. And I'm going to give an account for your life. And some of you might say, I don't want you to have to feel like you need to give an account. I said, that goes with the job. I don't get to opt out, and my members don't get to opt out. Right? Now, let's move on a little bit. The glory and the goal of membership. Okay? The goal of membership is that each member will enable the church to grow into maturity in Christ so that the members, individually and together, are able to increase, increasingly enjoy and demonstrate the new life they have in Christ. Now, I only read one verse out of this passage. In Ephesians chapter 4, here's what it says about what Christ did to constitute the church and what his goal for it is. Verse 11, so Christ uh, himself gave the apostles, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, and this is the key one, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Okay. So in our individual life and in our corporate life, we're called to follow Jesus. His passions and priorities should be the drive that's here. This is why we have to guard ourselves in the contentious environment in which we find ourselves is that we don't get co-opted by politics. We don't get co-opted by other causes outside, but that we hold on to Jesus so that we can re-engage in our culture with his heart and mind driving our engagement. That's why it is true that your first identity, you not, are not a Republican, you are not a Democrat, right? You're a follower of Jesus, right? And as we mentioned earlier, it, that means that as far as a Christian's engagement in the secular world, there is no secular organization where Christian interests will completely overlap with theirs. Because a Christian's interest is always to point people to Jesus. No secular organization has that as a goal. Right? So we will be co-belligerents with different groups of people who represent uh, what we believe are, are causes that will promote human flourishing, that will bless people and protect them and mitigate 
the effects of the fall, right? Diminish it. Right? We go after that, but we don't confuse our identity with a political party. We don't confuse our identity with a particular group of people or a cause, right? So this is why it's always a challenge for us as the people of God to keep following Jesus when the culture always wants to be the evaluator to tell you whether you're a good person or not by whether or not you say this or do that or whatever. And what Jesus says, if you represent me, as I put it to you before, the church's responsibility above everything else is to be full of Jesus and be following Jesus. Okay? Key thing, right? Third, what is nature of membership? Now, kids, if you're out there and you've probably already filled up your sheet that Tabitha, Miss Tabitha, made for you here today, she's got a great illustration of this idea of interdependence. I think she's got a business on there, I think she's talking about, and how everything has to work together for the business to make it. You've got to have customers, you've got to have suppliers, you've got to have uh, workers who put the things together, somebody who builds it, right? For a church to be a member means that believers in a church recognize that they are interdependent. No one can say they don't matter, and no one can say they don't need the others, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians 12 with me here, right? Many of you are aware of the body illustration that we have here. Come down to verse 15, where Paul presses his analogy, right, to get after us. Verse 15, now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, right? Uh, you can put whatever you want through there. Because I don't have these gifts, or I don't have these abilities, or I'm not of this ethnicity, or I'm not of this socioeconomic class, whatever the case may be, I don't belong to the body. Uh, he says, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, and I think this gets at, too, that sometimes what he's getting after is that we're angry with God or upset with God or disappointed with God at the hand he dealt us. The gifts we have, the background we came from, the resources we have or don't have, all those kind of things like that. And so sometimes we disqualify ourselves, sometimes we step back because we don't think we have anything to offer. But, but God says, no, no, no. You're already in the body. You just need to choose to be a part of it. And so he goes on. Uh, it would not for that reason uh, stop being part of the body. If the whole body was an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Okay? Now here, that, that's a radical thing. If you're here at Emmanuel, and you're coming here, one of my thoughts about you is that you're here because God brought you here. And I, I, I say this to many people who come in, I'm anticipating that God brought you here because there's something about your past experience, something about your gift set, something about how he's taken you through adversity, something about what, who you are and your gifts that God's brought here. And we at Emmanuel, we need to give you the freedom to use them and we need to anticipate you using them for our blessing. I, th I say this to every young person, right? Sometimes you think, well, I'm a member. I don't get full voting rights until I'm 18 to those. But you're a member of the body of Christ and you've been brought under here. And the question is, you don't get to sit back and be entertained until you get to be an adult. You're a member right now. I don't care whether you're 12 or 14 or 16. You come with the same responsibilities just at the age and stage that you are. So you ought to be walking in here and thinking, I need to be praying for the kids in my youth group. I need to be praying for my friends. I need to be thinking about what kind of influence I am to the other boys. And so I was, t I was joking with Sam and, and uh, uh, Sam and Ben this morning as they were talking together as a group of guys, right? Well, as followers of Jesus, it's one thing to talk about all the normal things you do as guys. It's another thing to say, we're followers of Jesus together. We're followers of Jesus together. What does that mean? Right? So I need to be praying about my brothers. I need to be praying about my sisters. I need to be praying for them if they're struggling with their parents. I need to be helping them to, to lean in and trust and helping find ways to get around it. Right? So you can be engaged right where you are. And that's the same thing for every adult. So we don't speak of members as people who step in and say, I'm here. Let's see what kind of good church you are or not based on how you treat me. A believer's walking in and saying, okay, Christ, I'm here. You've given me all the resources I need. 
God, help me to love well this morning. Right? Help me to love well this morning. Get busy. When I'm looking for opportunities up there, I'm, I'm looking through, right? There's a lot of opportunities right now in terms of serving our children, right? There's not a parent in here who doesn't want people to love their children toward Jesus. So you be that parent, right? Take the opportunity to do that. Step into these roles, right? Come to blast. Do those different things. People, you have an opportunity to shape people, right? Every one of us who know Jesus, who grew up in the church, I had a lot of people love me to Jesus before I decided to follow him by God's grace, okay? So those are the kind of things here, but I'm interdependent. I need you. Um, I sat down with some students in my office the other day, uh, some of them going through a hard time, and one in particular, and I told them this, and I, I, I look at my, my ministry at Cedarville this way. I said, I just want you to know is that I want to tell you things and represent things that I prayed and hope that other faculty and other people would represent on my behalf to my daughters when they came to Cedarville. Because I, I want to take care of the stewardship. And so right now, we have the ability, every child in here is a group project, right? And I, every, every parent in here, sometimes you know as a parent, sometimes your kids, their ears get close to your voice. You feel frustrated. You're trying to tell them something. They don't get it. And what are you doing? You're praying for somebody else to tell them something that they're hearing from you all the time. But for some reason, because of the relationship they have to that coach or the relationship they have to that Sunday school teacher or the relationship they have to that youth worker, all of a sudden they're open to that counsel in a way that you can't get to them. And, right, and if you've had those moments as a parent, then they walk back to you and say, hey, dad, guess what I learned? And you just want to pull your hair out. I don't have any to pull out. I have to do something else. But you want to pull your hair out because I've been saying that for like 20 years. Well, they couldn't hear it from me for whatever reason. Right? And maybe I laid the foundation, but that was the catalyst. And I want to be that person in the lives of the kids here. You want to be that person in the lives of the kids here. You never know what a, a, a conversation going down the hall where you stop and, and you attend to someone and you just say, you're important and worth my time, and I just want to give you time and listen to you. You think, I didn't do anything big. For that person, you did something life-changing. Right? So God forgive us if our kids feel like they're just in the background and people are not investing in them. Right? In terms of that. Okay, move on. The issue here. Well, what's the challenge of membership? Every member is called to pursue unity and overcome division. Right? Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Okay? This is a crazy thing. Everybody here who has believed in Jesus Christ, member of Emmanuel or not, everybody who's believed in Jesus Christ, you're united to Christ and therefore you're united to all the rest of us. And we don't think about this, but for every person in this room who has come to believe in Jesus Christ, I have more real, lasting, genuine bonds with you than I have with any of my closest relatives who have rejected Jesus. So here's what God says that the Spirit has done, chapter 4. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and, and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, notice here, you don't make the unity. The unity already exists. You're called to keep it, right? So I know I've told you this illustration before, but this is a, when you were born into your biological family, right, you didn't get any, your, your parents did not come to you and ask you whether or not you wanted your brother or sister, right? So... Uh, Sophia, when Hannah was born, and Sophia's there, and Hannah, uh, Sophia, how much older are you than Hannah? Five years. So there's five-year-old Sophia there. Uh, Mom and Dad didn't walk up and say, hey, we're, we're, we've got this new girl that's coming home from the hospital. Should we keep her or not, Sophia? Right? No, she just said, here she is. Right? You've got to learn. There's a unity that's already been created. You've got to keep it. Right? So, you know, my, my favorite story, right, from my family is my, my third daughter, Victoria, looking at Dominique, the youngest daughter, as we're trying to load her in the van from the hospital. We're excited about bringing her home, and my, my, my two-year-old right there looking at her and says, I don't want her. I don't want her. You just put her right back in the hospital, all right? Just a hmm, little face just, you know, like that. I don't want her, right? And in the body of Christ, right, is that our sinfulness will say, I don't want her. 
I don't want him. I, I want people who like the music I like. I want people who read books like I read. I want people who, who pay attention to the same podcasts I do. I want people who like to drink coffee, right? I want people, and we choose those little groups, and God said, no, 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 no. You're already a family. You've got to make it work. And there's some crazy uncles in the, in the body of Christ, crazy aunts, some immature people, right? I mean, all, they're all over the body of Christ, and you don't get to say, I'm not, it's too embarrassing to be with them. No, they're your brother in Christ. You go after them. You identify with them. And we have many believers who would rather identify with somebody who's culturally cool, who rejects Jesus Christ, than embrace a brother who's immature in Christ. Okay? So the idea here, and then finally here, what are the members responsible for? And this will come back at some other time to go in detail. But here I want to I give you some, these are weighty. In 1 Timothy 4, this is a passage where he's talking to Timothy as a teacher. And what's happening in 1 Timothy 4 is the church at Ephesus is tolerating teachers who are teaching false doctrine. Matter of fact, they've become a group of people who have itching ears that they want, what he means, they want a teacher who tells them what they want to hear instead of what God says that they need to hear. And it should be the case because we're all fallen people, meaning we've turned our back on the Lord, we've been saved by God, we've been brought to him by grace, we didn't earn it, God just rescued us, and we're all growing people. There is no person in this room, I don't care how long you've been with Jesus, that you don't have sin in your life that you don't struggle. And so you should expect, if we love you, that we will make you aware of that for your good so that you can turn away from it for your blessing and the blessing of the people in your life. If you come here every time and all you walk away with is just feeling good about yourself when you're being a really uh, uh, a nasty, careless, selfish person, we're doing you no good. So the teachers should be, and what it assumes that the congregation is culpable because they're letting it happen. So you need to know your scriptures as the people of God. And then second, to appoint and follow church leaders. We already read that from Hebrews 13, 17, right? Should, 7 and 17 are two of those, right? The church comes together, and when it says, right, for a leader, 1 Timothy chapter 3, if somebody desires to be a leader, well, then the church is to look into their character, so somebody doesn't walk up, none of the elders walked up to the church and said, okay, I've been called by God to be a pastor, make me your pastor. And people say, oh, I guess we got to do that. No, somebody comes along and says, I, I, I've been thinking about it, or somebody's approached me and I'm thinking about being an elder, and then the church is called to look into their character and life to see if they have spiritual maturity. Okay. But you need a church that's healthy to be able to do that. The maturity of the leaders will reflect the spiritual health of the body. And then second, third, to love and serve their fellow members. Romans 12 is a wonderful passage just to read through of all the things that God calls us to do in the body of Christ and then to regularly assemble together with each other. Don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. You know, some people are here this morning that the biggest thing that happened is that they walked in and saw a bunch of other Jesus followers and somebody just cared for them. They, the message that I'm giving today, they're not ready to hear because they're so hurting and so broken. They just needed somebody to hug them today. They needed somebody to say, I'm praying for you today. They needed someone just to come along and say, I'm representing the heart of Jesus toward you. I love you and I'm holding you up before him today. Hold on. Right? We need to be around each other. You also know in your own life, if sin is operative in your life, if sin is there, you know what sin always wants you to do? Withdraw and hide. Right? So coming to the light to one another where you've got people who lovingly embrace you and they're calling you toward what God wants you to be, we need the body of Christ. Okay, so if you're thinking about membership at Emmanuel, that's what you're getting into. But I'm not saying this because this is Emmanuel's. I really, really feel that this is what the Scriptures teach is about what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. This is not a club where you get hot towels and preferred seating. Okay? Not that. It's not a place where you get to come and be the judge and jury of how everybody else is doing. And that's not what it is. 
This is a place where you come to other brothers and sisters who are on the way following Jesus and you're thrown in and you know you need their help and, and they need yours and you're here to do work, right? And you're loving people and you're being loved by people and God help us to be those kinds of people, right? Now, uh, I'll come back a little bit later and talk about how to wrap it up here, uh, but let me pray with you right now. And would you bow your heads with me here? Um, my major burden this morning, if you don't hear me say anything else this morning, if you're not a member of the church, if you have never come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if even that phrase just sounds like a bunch of in-house Christian mumbo-jumbo, I- I'm praying for you today that you'll recognize that Jesus is a real, the God of all gods, the King of all kings, who is actively at work today, and he has given his life to rescue you from everything that truly threatens you, And all he asks of you is to put down your rebellion, stop looking to other things to save you, and put them down and say, God, do for me what I can't do for myself. I trust in you. If that hasn't happened to you today, I'm begging you in the name of Christ. That's the most loving thing I can tell you to do today. And you can do that today. You can bow and you can say, Lord, I I need you. Save me. Deliver me. Forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for me. Lord, give me the life that he's given. You can do that today, and I pray that that would be the case. And then secondly, if you're here today and you're in the church, but you're standing back from committing to this group of believers, I just want to ask you why. Why? What are you hoping to protect or keep? What are you afraid you're going to lose? Pray with me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your kindness to us today. Lord, thank you for all that we have. Lord, I I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, as I look over this sea of faces, Lord, there are many people who have sustained me in my times of discouragement. There are many people that have rebuked me in times when I've lost my way. Lord, there are people who have have, uh, come alongside of me just to uh, be a friend and to walk with me. Lord, thank you for each one of them. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Christ, Lord, today, Lord, would they put down the, the, their arms? Would they stop running? Lord, I pray that they would just give up, Lord, and turn their lives over to you today. Lord, thank you that you rescue us. Thank you that you come after us in our rebellion. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are here. They've been at Emmanuel. I pray that you, they would hear my heart and my desire for them. Lord, that what I'm commending to them is not something that's trying to constrain them, but Lord, I believe in Scripture as something that's calling them to a kind of life, a kind of way of existing in relationship to your people that you demonstrate and call us to. Lord, help them, encourage them, bless them, Lord, I pray. And so Lord, help us to be your people. We pray in the name of Christ, amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. If you're going to meet in one of our small groups today, really what I'm encouraging you to do, to think and reflect over, come together, share your needs together, pray for one another, be the body of Christ. And then I want to encourage you, right? You can do, almost anybody can do this. Go right to the website and pull off our covenant, our member's covenant. Talk together and say, what do you think that we at Emmanuel do really well from what we've covenanted together, and what do you think we struggle at? Right? And pray for the body to be more of the people that we've committed to be. Right? As we do that. God bless you. Have a great day.